Let's stand as we read the scriptures together. This is my fourth time preaching. It's fourth quarter. Come on. We're going to preach. And then I can jump on a plane. I go to the Orange County campus, preach tonight. Amen. Drive home first thing tomorrow morning. Get home from all the way from Orange County in two hours and 30 minutes. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Don't ask how, just... I don't really go that fast. It's two hours and 45. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. It says this. The Bible says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to a, mar to, she was engaged to a married man. Get this Las Vegas translation out of here in Jesus' name. What is going on with me? Let's try that again. She was engaged to what? Thank you. To a man who is not married yet. His name was Joe. Somebody say Joe. Joe. Yeah. A descendant of King David, Gabriel appeared to her, that's an angel, and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor or grace with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom, come on, somebody, will never end. Ooh, I love that. Mary asked the angel, but how can this, how, how, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. And another, another translation says, how can this happen? I have not known a man. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. Now, I don't know if that was a great miracle or not if you're 70 and want to have a baby again. How many of you want grandkids at 70? Not, not giving birth. Come on, ladies, at 70. Amen. Verse 37 for nothing is impossible with God. Come on, let's all the church, 1145, last one. Let's all say it together. Ready? One, two, three, four. Nothing is impossible with God. Say it like you mean it. Four. Nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true, and the angel left her. Father, thank you for this time that we have. I, I, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would open up our ears, and, but more than that, open up our hearts. Every young man, every young lady, married, unmarried, every ethnicity, background, rich and poor, and everybody in between. Online campus all over the world, God, I ask, Lord, that you would speak to us as only you can. In Jesus' name, come on, the church, give me a big amen. 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 You may be seated. We're starting a new series called Expect. Expect. This is our Christmas series, which will last a couple weeks. And, and I love it because this is the time that we expect things during Christmas. Especially if you're a kid. When you were a kid growing up, how many of you expected, come on, some Christmas gifts during Christmas? You know, when I was a kid, we had the Christmas tree, and my mom and my dad would wrap the presents. But I was one of those devious kids. I always wanted to find out what I was getting. Come on, before I got it. I was the consummate box shaker, as if shaking the box told me what was in it. But then I progressed to ninja status as I began to get under, understand the, the ancient art of peeling the tape away. So slowly that it would not rip the paper, but it would open up enough for me to see what gift was there. My mom and dad got smarter and started double taping, triple taping. Thus, I got myself an exacto knife. Come on, somebody. And begin to slice and dice that gift open and then rewrap it. And they never knew. This is a true story. I mean, this is the way we were growing up because, you know, we were expecting these gifts. If you grew up in the Perez household when I was young, we didn't wait till Christmas morning to open up gifts because we wanted to open up on Christmas Day. Technically, Christmas starts at 12 midnight. So we, as a family, would go to bed at like 8 or 9 o'clock at night, Christmas Eve. And we were told to go to sleep 
but you wouldn't be sleeping. It was like torture for three hours. Looking at the clock, looking at the clock, because at 12 midnight, my parents would say, Santa came. We jump out of bed with my underoos on, running as fast as I could. And we go to the place where before we went to bed, there was a plate with chocolate chip cookies. And there was a cup with hot chocolate. And my mom would say, this is for Santa. And he comes, he's going to eat cookies and drink his hot chocolate, drop off gifts, and then go back up the chimney. All right. So we got up. It's 12 midnight. I have a brother, three sisters. There's five of us living in Pico Rivera, and we're running and gunning. Could leave our guns to the side because it was safe. No shooting took place that night. It was a truce in my neighborhood. Amen. And we would go by the plate, and the cookies were gone. Hot chocolate was empty. Santa was here. We go into the living room, and there was my mom and my dad. And I began to notice that my dad had cookie crumbs on his chest. <laughs> had hot chocolate right around his lip. I began to realize Santa Claus is Mexican. What's up with that? That's crazy. I thought he was black all this time. And we would rip open the gifts, and most of the time, our expectation was right. I had expected a Hot Wheels thing, and I got that Hot Wheels. I expected a Batman kind of, you know, big wheel, and there it was. And, but there was times when I was expecting something that I didn't get it. But I lived with expectation. Now I'm a parent, and I don't know what it is, but it's in the genes. I caught my kids yesterday shaking the boxes. Come on, somebody. And I was like, they're like my mom and my dad, put the boxes down. And then I saw Wendy shaking the box. Put it down, Wendy. You're going to break the diamond. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Not really. And my kids, though, are, are awesome. My six-year-old. He's just so expectant. He can't wait for Santa. Pastor Ben, I can't believe that you talk about Santa Claus. I mean, it's about Jesus. I know, Scrooge. I know. But if that bothers you, come to my house because you'll see a Christmas tree all decorated with presents underneath. That's pagan. Well, pagan this. My kids need to enjoy Christmas because we read the Christmas story before we open up the gifts and let them know what Christmas, come on, somebody, is really all about. But my six-year-old, man, he's like, Dad, I can't wait for Christmas. Can we open up the presents today? I said, son, it's 11 days. It doesn't matter, you know. He just, he's not my nine-year-old. She's getting a little bit more sophisticated. Bella, are you ready for Christmas? Yes. What did you want? A Barbie. Do you think dad got her for you? Yes. <laughs> now I have a 13-year-old. Is he in here? He had puberty already, hair everywhere, hormones going crazy. BG, you ready for, for, for Christmas? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dad. Show some excitement. I am excited. I'm a middle schooler. That's how excited I get. Wait till I become a high schooler. Mm. <laughs> but what happens when you're adults? I mean, most of us, we're, well, sometimes we're adults. Christmas, oh, God. Shopping. Money. Kids don't even appreciate stuff. I mean, you really got to go shopping and fight people. Where's the Christmas spirit? I mean, something's happened to your expector. Because when you get older, you start expecting more negative than positive. I never hear Benaya saying, is it Christmas? He's six. Do we really have to go shopping? Too many people. Are you kidding me? He's like ninja status. Dad, send me on assignment. He will find and fight for that present in Jesus' name. 
But as we get older, sometimes we lose the wonder, don't we, of Christmas? We lose the wonder and the expectation of what it all means. We read the story now in Luke chapter 1, and it's about this young lady named Mary. Now, I've preached the Christmas story for 27 years. This is, this is something I'm going, Lord, how can I keep preaching the same thing over and over again? Lord, put the wonder of Christmas back in me. Let me, Lord God, be a man that is expecting that you're still going to do something miraculous. And it doesn't matter if I've seen 26 of them. I've seen 27 of them. But God, you... You never, ever do the same thing twice the same way. He's creative. We find ourselves in Luke chapter 1, and there is this young lady, and most scholars would say this young lady, her name is Mary, and she's probably 13, 14, the very oldest 15 years of age. The Bible says now that Mary is expecting something. She now is expecting that she is now going to consummate her marriage. The Bible says that she is betrothed. The word betrothed is a word that indicates in Jesus' day that you were legally married. You were a husband and wife, but you had not yet come together for sexual intimacy, and you have not consummated the marriage. Even though you're husband and wife, you're not living together, but the only way you can break this betrothal is through a letter of divorce. Thus, we see in another passage of Scripture that Joe, a.k.a. Joseph, finds out that Mary is pregnant, and he's thinking about divorcing her quietly, not to embarrass her. And the angel comes, begins to explain to him what has happened. Mary now is very simply expecting that life is going to go the way she has planned it. She's expecting to get married. She's walking around this town, Nazareth, in Galilee, saying, I'm going, I'm going to get married. I am going to get married. I'm going to get married. And Joseph's is my husband. I'm going to get mar no, married. Right? I, I know I can't sing, but she could have. She's skipping around town. I'm going to get married. I'm going to get married. She goes to bed one night. And right now, about 1 o'clock in the morning, poof, an angel shows up, beaming everywhere, and begins to tell her that, Mary, you're going to get pregnant. You're going to get pregnant. She was just singing the song. I'm going to get married. I'm going to get married. Then I will get pregnant. The angel shows up and says, no, no. You're going to get pregnant. You're going to get pregnant. Well, wait a second. Mary's whole life gets turned upside down because her expectation was for the normal. Her life was just going to be normal. Her life was going to go the way she had planned it. But I'm here to tell you, my friends, God has the unexpected in store for you. The Lord spoke to me in the first message in this series is, expect, come on, the unexpected. Expect the unexpected. Mary is expecting to get married. She's got Joe. She's betrothed. Things are going to go well. And all of a sudden now, what happens with Mary? Mary gets an unexpected marriage from this angel. The angel Gabriel shows up and begins to declare something to her. And notice what the Bible says in verse 26. It's very important that we see this. It says that God sent the angel. Do not just read over that and just try to get to the good part of what he's going to tell her. We have to look at the Bible because the Bible says that God sent an angel. Don't minimize this. Why? Because God is the initiator of this whole event. He said, no, no, no. I'm going to send a message. I'm going to send an angel. God is the initiator, and we are the responders. I got good news for you. God is about ready to initiate some incredible things for for you at the end of this year and in 2014, I'm declaring that 2014 is the year of expectation. God sent an angel to this young lady named Mary. Now watch me. We don't know why Mary was chosen. We don't, the Bible doesn't indicate to us that she is 
anything other than a virgin. You say, well, that's the reason why, pastor. She's a virgin. No, there was a lot of virgins in Jesus' day. Because if you were not a virgin and they found out, they would have killed you. That would keep purity alive. Not only would they stone you, they would also stone the man that you slept with. <laughs> this is not modern-day America. You actually got married first. Then you had children. There's nothing special about Mary. The Bible indicates something that the angel says to her, Mary, you have found favor. That that word favor is actually the word grace. You have found grace. And because God's grace has found you. See, there was nothing special about Mary, but God had a special plan. Come on, for Mary. It's all by God's grace that God comes to her and begins to tell her through this angel, Mary, the unexpected is about ready to happen in your life. I tell you by the Holy Spirit as I was studying and praying this week, and this is in my spirit, the Holy Spirit wanted me to declare over the church, over those on the internet, that this is the year coming up of the unexpected, unexpected blessings, unexpected good things, unexpected open doors. Come on. Unexpected financial breakthroughs. Unexpected. 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 Expect. Come on, somebody. The unexpected. But here's what we do. Oh, we expect bad things. I remember growing up in church and God began to do some good things in our family and God began to do good things in our, in our church. And this is the charismatic saying. They always just say, oh, watch out. When God starts blessing, the devil starts messing. I'm like, really? Show me a scripture for that. So there was an indication of, oh, God's doing good things. Whoo, yeah, better watch out because the devil's going to do a bad thing. Then I don't want good things because I don't want bad things. You need to live with great expectation that God is good and God is going to do good things, come on, in your life. And I don't care what the devil does. I want to be devil conscious. Come on. I want to be God conscious. <laughs> Expect the unexpected. Mary, there's an unexpected blessing coming your way. He begins to talk to her about this blessing. Now, it's interesting that Mary is living in Nazareth in Galilee. Now, I don't know how to say it other than to say it this way, okay? This was like the ghetto or the hood. They actually said nothing good comes out of Nazareth. This is a place that everybody would look down on. Oh, you live on that side of town. You grew up in that neighborhood with those people. Now, they always say that when they're not in that neighborhood. You say that stuff in the neighborhood I grew up, you wouldn't make it out alive. But you say it when you're not there. This is what they said about Nazareth. They, they would say, Nazareth, oh, nothing's good. Could it be that God purposely chose a bad place with bad circumstances to show that no matter how bad things are, he can still do something, and you can expect, come on, the unexpected, no matter what your background is, no matter where you grew up, no matter what they said, no matter what people are saying about you, you have God on your side. Come on, help me. You have God, and God's coming, and God sees you. God knows where you are. God knows who you are. God has his hand on you, and when he picks you and promotes you, no man can demote you. I get tired of people saying, well, if I grew up in this family. No, there is no perfect family. As soon as you close that front door, they're jacked just like you. Okay, let me trust some real people right now. There is no perfect family. We all have challenges. That's why we need the grace of God in our lives. See, people, we want to make excuses. Well, if I, was, if I had a church in the South, I would be bigger. If I was here, if I went to that school, if I had this, if I had that. Now, there's no question that some people have a little bit of an advantage. 
There's no question about that. But as a follower of Jesus, with God on your side, you could expect the unexpected. If God could do something for a girl named Mary, come on in Nazareth, I think God could still do something for you and for me. Devil, I don't care what you do. Our God is super, above, abounding. No matter what happens, he still can do the unexpected. See, we got to get our expector up. We got to get it up. My question to us is how do you come to church? I mean, if you come to church long enough, sometimes you just come, well, well, it's going to come in and get out. Let me tell you how a lot of people come to church. Uh, Hurry up. Kids, get in the car. Where's your mom? She said five minutes, it's been 20. No, oh, yeah, thank you. I got one, one witness over here. No, that's, that's the way it happens, right? You're screaming. You're yelling. I'm ah, ah, honking. You, you, you're talking about me. This is me. This is how I get here in the morning. Come on, BJ, hurry up. Comb your hair. Brush your teeth. But now that you brush your teeth, no, I forgot. Go back and brush your teeth. <laughs> Come on, guys. I'm the pastor. I got to get there on time. I see how people, because I'm in the parking lot, and it's amazing what you see. No, no, no. It's, it's um, I mean, I see it. I see it. You're turning before. You're turning. I mean, it's going crazy in the van. And as soon as you come on the church parking lot, oh, oh. angels singing. Shabbat Oh, you weren't doing that out on that street over there? And I see the expression on some of your faces. It's like, God, why does he have to be out here? God, why do you have to be so late? I wouldn't be out there. You wouldn't see me out there. I see how people are like, "Ah," and I just look, I'm going, and I'm glad people come here. But what happens if we kind of shifted things? And we started getting some expectation high. We start driving to church, man. You know, I, I believe God's got a word for me. I believe God's going to touch me. I believe God's going to encourage me so I can go out and encourage somebody else. Lord, I just believe somebody's going to get healed. Come on, I believe somebody's going to get delivered. I believe somebody's going to... What, what happened? Why, why is it that when I, I used to play sports professionally, I played sports. In my own mind, I did. But even when I played in junior high school, I was the MVP in junior high. I brag about it. I know. Not everybody can do that. But before every game, Pastor Daniel, we get in a circle and we kind of, you know, kind of psych ourselves up. We never said, guys, we expect to lose by 20 points. Just want to let you know. They're bigger. They're stronger. They're called Finley Prep. We can't beat them. Just. It's just hurt them. We never thought that. We just got, we got us off side up. We expected we're going to win. Now, we didn't win all the time, but there was that expectation. You know, real fans cheer even when they know you're going to lose. They just cheer for you. You need to come because in the natural, we may lose. But we're driving to church. We're getting to worship, and we're going to glorify Jesus. And Jesus has never lost. He's never going to lose. He doesn't plan on losing. Come on, we can get our expectation up and say, come on, Jesus. We trust you. Come on, Jesus. You're going to do something. Come on, Jesus. I'm not leaving church the same way. I'm going to get a word. I'm going to get encouraged. I'm going to be different. Mary has this word. You're going to get pregnant. Mary's like, time out. I have not known a man. I took biology class. There needs to be a little egg and a little thing that's swimming. That's not happening. See, when God gets ready to do the unexpected, he doesn't need your help. Let me try this section over here. 
When God gets ready, I feel this, to do the unexpected. That means he's God. He's supernatural. He supersedes you. He's not natural. He's supernatural. He can do exceedingly, abundantly, accomplish infinitely more than we might think, ask, or even imagine. So watch me. She says, okay, wait a second. It's not unbelief, but how can this be angel? I've not known a man. And the angel now tells her, let me tell you something, Mary. You're going to now receive unexpected power. Unexpected power. You're going to receive an unexpected advantage. He says, let me tell you what's going to happen, Mary. This is going to be not of your own doing, but now this is going to be because of the unexpected power of the Holy Spirit. He says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And he's going to overshadow you. And that which is to be born is going to be of the Holy Spirit. Mary had, has nothing to base what he said on. She can't think about somebody else who is now a virgin. And now she's going to get pregnant supernaturally. This is the only time it's ever happened. And so Mary is a little taken back. Because her concept of the Holy Spirit is Old Testament. The Holy Spirit would come and he would go. He would come and he would go. He'd come on, a, on Samson, rip a lion in two, and he would leave. And now the Holy Spirit would come and go based on the person's obedience. The New Testament or the New Covenant, when you become born again, the Holy Spirit now, as you trust Jesus, he comes and now he lives in you. And he'll never leave you or forsake you. He doesn't come and go based on our obedience. Because if he did, he's here on Sunday, gone on Monday. He's here on Tuesday, and Wednesday it's youth night. He's with me. Friday night, party night, he's gone. That's the way the Old Testament was. But in the New Covenant, God resides with you. And it's not based on your obedience. In the new covenant, it is based on what Jesus has done. And now you have been blessed with the promised Holy Spirit. And now because you have been blessed, the fruit of that is obedience. The root is being blessed and being in Christ. The fruit is that the Holy Spirit in you begins to manifest fruit out of you. And now, obedience is a byproduct of relationship. Obedience is not a pre-step uh, for you to have a relationship with God. You come to him, trust him, and now he does something in you that begins to work itself outside of you. The Holy Spirit is going to come, Mary, and this Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you. It's going to come with so much power that it's going to do something that's never been done before. I want to make a declaration that you can expect the unexpected in 2014 coming up. Why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit is going to begin to do things in your life that's going to blow your mind. I want to make a declaration that this church, and there's great churches, Judd Wilhite is one of my best friends, uh, and, 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 and Vance Pittman is one of my great friends at Hope Baptist, and Canyon Ridge is a great church, and South Hills is a great church, and the Calvary Chapel is a great church with John Knapp down the street. They're all great churches. I pray for them. And friends, I can't speak for them, but let me speak for this church, that this church affirms and believes in the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit. I say that again. This church affirms, come on, and believes in the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the nine gifts of the Spirit. I believe in the gift of miracles, the gift of faith. I believe in prophecy. I believe that we can speak in tongues. I believe that we can see more healings and deliverances. I believe that God wants to do more supernatural things in our lives. If we take supernatural activity out of Christianity, we become a philosophy. 
Christianity is not becoming a better person. Christianity is dead people coming back to life. You can be good without God. I mean, there's a lot of Mormons. Whew, they're clean cut, man. Ride those bikes good. Knock on doors. Witness for what they believe is the truth. Good people, good marriages, good families. I'm not knocking them. There's good Jehovah's Witnesses. I just wish they wouldn't knock on my door on Saturday. There's good Baptists, good Pentecostals. There's good Hindus, good Muslims, very good Buddhists who abstain from everything. And they, they practice asceticism where they would somehow beat their flesh and, and make sure that they don't do anything wrong or they have any lust or they have any of this. And they're very good people. I mean, the Dalai Lama, I think, is a good man. But being good doesn't make you qualified for heaven. You could be good, but you can't be righteous. Righteousness only comes when you turn and trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ that took place on the cross, come on, over 2,000 years ago. And we now say, we now trust you, Jesus. You are the King and Lord of our life. Supernatural. I believe that people are going to get healed of cancer in our church. Okay, let me, let, me, let me try this section over here. I believe somebody's going to get healed of AIDS in our church. I do believe that. I do believe, come on, heart disease. Come on, I believe in possible situations. I believe that we can expect, come on, the unexpected in 2014 because we're going to have Holy Spirit activity that's going to begin to overshadow you and overshadow your situation. And you're going to look back and say, oh, my God, how did this happen? The Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. You know, it's interesting that when the Holy Spirit begins to move, even skeptics don't move. Obviously, I don't know, it was a few weeks ago, maybe a longer ago, and the Holy Ghost began to move, and, and man, people started coming back in, and we started praying for people, and, and people started getting prof prophetic words, and, and God began to heal people. And here's why people have trouble with the moving of the Holy Spirit, because a lot of times it's portrayed as being spooky, and weird. I, I have people coming to me all the time. Hey, you know, I, I, I talk with angels all the time. I see them all the time. I'm like, really? Yeah, when you preach, this, somebody's told me, there's big angels on both sides of you. What do they look like? Oh, they're about nine foot tall. Brown skin. Why do they have to be brown skin? You racist. Why don't they be white skinned? <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, they start, and they explain like, like it's a Hispanic angel. Can I tell you, there is no such things like that in the Bible. They're not like, oh, there's an African-American one. There's an Asian one. Hey, buddy. Orale, there's the Hispanic one. I mean, <laughs> angels are supernatural beings. Be careful about people who are so much into angels, they never talk about or see Jesus. I want to hear more about Jesus. I want to hear more about what Jesus has done. I want to hear about the finished work of Jesus Christ. I want to hear about there's healing. Come on, there's deliverance. Come on, there's hope. There's love. There's peace. There's joy. That he is the first and the last. The beginning and the end. The alpha and the omega. There's nobody greater. There's nobody higher. There's nobody more powerful. It's all about Jesus. I don't like spooky people. I don't think I'm spooky, but I'm supernatural. And you're supernatural. If you're a follower of Jesus... We all have supernatural Holy Spirit activity in our lives. Let me give you an example. Everybody who's a follower of Jesus will have this happen to you. All of a sudden, you want to go someplace, and the Holy Spirit says, don't go there. You don't know if it's the Holy Spirit. You just feel like, man, I just feel like we shouldn't go there. It's not a woman's intuition. It's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit begins, begins to lead and guide you. The Holy Spirit will begin to say, you know what? Don't trust that person. There's an agenda. Ladies, you need to listen to the Holy Spirit. My wife, will, my wife will meet a guy and go, oh, he's dirty. He's dirty. He didn't do anything. No, Benny, he's dirty. He's a pervert. And then sure enough, it comes out that he's weird. 
and he's a pervert. You need, what are you guys laughing about? It's true. <laughs> Daniel, what are you laughing about in the front row? Did they ever say that about you? Just, you're okay. Everybody sees you and said, he's holy. He's upright. I want him. I mean, that's what they say. You know what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit say, apply at this job. The Holy Spirit will say, say this. The Holy Spirit says, make this deal. Come on, are you with me? Holy Spirit says, go to this university. Holy Spirit says, don't go. Holy Spirit says, stay at this church. Holy Spirit says, I'm leaving you. I'm launching to another church. The Holy Spirit says, take this job. Quit this job. Do this. Holy Spirit says, marry that person. Don't marry that person. But once you're married, work it out. The Holy Spirit is not in you as a married man saying, marry that person. You're married. How do you know it's the Holy Spirit? He'll never contradict the written word of God. We need supernatural activity. I'm tired of coming to church knowing what we're going to do, knowing what we're going to sing, knowing what's going to happen. Come on, God. We want to expect some unexpected moving. Is there anybody with me? Come on, Church LV. Come on. Come on. Come on, man. Come back to the keyboards because expectantly, unexpectedly, I'm ending. <laughs> well, Pastor, I don't want to invite friends because if we're going to expect the unexpected, how can I prep them for it? <laughs> I know. I, I listen. I have neighbors too. It's like, oh, Jesus, what are you going to do? Oh, God. Have you ever thought that God knew who was coming? And what you think may freak some people out may actually be the thing that draws them in. There doesn't need to be another central Christian. It's one great, big church. There doesn't need to be a central clone or a whole Baptist clone or whatever church clone. We need to be the church LV. And travel a road that is very difficult at times because there's this tension. I have people that say, this church isn't charismatic enough. We need more Holy Spirit movement. And then, I mean, just like two people later, you know, it's a little out there. And so it's like, I'm just, in 2014, I'm just praying that the Lord would just do things that are unmistakable, imprinted with his hand, that only God could do 